The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. everybody <laughs> again it's a wonderful thing to be with everybody God's family you know God puts us in families we're perfectly designed for that perfect family in the body of Christ that God has intended from us to be from the beginning of time so you know this morning I want to start by sharing a little story and this story is about a little girl And this little girl was about six years old, and her mom would bring her to Sunday school. And I really loved Sunday school because guess what? There were lots of kids there, and it was fun to go to Sunday school. And one Sunday morning, my Sunday school teacher, she gave a verse, and it was, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of fresh. That is the heart. Well, this little girl didn't really understand any of that, but she did know that there were, that this epistle There was something about it. That teacher, that Sunday school teacher, had life on that. The Sunday school teacher was excited about this epistle. So on the way home, this little girl asked her mom, what is an epistle? And she said, it's a book written by man on a heart. And I thought, I mean, written by God on a person's heart. And I decided right back then, I was sitting in the back seat, my little legs wiggling, I wanted to be that book. So I, that night, when I laid down, <laughs> as you figure, I'm this little girl. When I laid my head on the pillow, I used to talk to Jesus. And I said, you know what, I really want to be this living epistle. I want to be this book. And all I knew is it was pretty exciting. I just could picture, I was very... Uh, Uh, visual (laughs) that I was this book and I wanted to be that and I didn't even know why I wanted to be that so as I as it happened as I grew up in the church I read my Bible I prayed then I learned about prayer say after me prayers because I had some places in my heart that weren't so living I knew Jesus was the answer, but I really, really, really didn't know how to grasp, how to become that living word. How do you become that? I knew all the scriptures about it. I knew that Christ had promised this abundant life. In fact, John 10, 10 says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. But there was this lack of abundance in my life. Now, I love Jesus. The home that I grew up in, I had mom who who followed Jesus to the best of her ability and pointed me to Jesus. My dad wasn't saved, but I had an I had a very unsettled home. There was always ups and downs and this and that. And so therefore I learned to maneuver in a in a very unsettled situation. Now, as I grew up and got married to Cliff, and we had a scripture in our home that, you know, our family wanted to serve God. That's a Joshua scripture about serving serving God. We wanted our family to serve God. So there was always this hunger and this, this searching, this longing for how do I become who Christ said that I was. Now, What's very, very interesting is that I was well aware 
about, I was well, well aware that we have a positional relationship in Christ. In other words, when we are saved, we're given access to the Father. Now, there was another thing that came, a big thing that came, a big, uh, it was part of the Westminster Catechism, and it says, what's the chief purpose of man? I was always wondering, what is the purpose? Well, it was to enjoy him, but I wasn't having much enjoyment <laughs> in my life. And I thought, well, and I was trying super hard. I come from New England, and in New England, we are hardworking, we are practical, we are, let's get it moving. So I took all of this hardworking, let's get going with my scriptures, with my prayer, with all of the things, all of the tools that I had in my life. But there was this missing part, this big, big missing part, because positionally, I knew where I stood in Christ. I was well versed in the scriptures, but experientially there was a gap there. And every once in a while, like I would be worshiping and oh, I could feel God's presence worshiping. I love to worship. I used to worship in my kitchen by myself for hours when the kids would be at school and I could feel God's presence, but I couldn't, I couldn't stay there. I, there was a, there was once I was interacting in life with people and circumstances, these things would come up in me and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I know the scripture. We're not supposed to be angry. We're not supposed to be um, feeling uh, frustrated and all these things. But I thought, Lord, how do I, how do I become transformed? What's the process of this transformation? I'm the kind of person I want to know how is it done? What is that big picture? What is that goal that God had? Now, before you were born, each and every person who has Jesus as Lord and Savior has a planned purpose and good works for which God created them to do. And we cannot go forward in these good works Unless we're, unless we're in union and communion with God. But there are barriers. Now, you know, positionally, when Jesus died on the cross, that barrier came down. The veil was rent in two. It gave us access. But now Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, three in one, triune, has the ability to commune with us. But where is our ability to commune with him. How does that happen? When, we're, when we were saved, we had that access. Now, I had tools in my life that I had grown up with, and I didn't realize it. And one day in prayer as I was agonizing, why do I keep banging into the same places over and over again? Now, they weren't huge things, but they were attitudes. They were things that kept me from a sense of fullness, an ability to enjoy God. And I so wanted to do that. Well, while I was praying, <laughs> the Lord said to me very clearly, Stina, I would like to give you some new tools. I was like, new tools. Now, my dad was a builder. He had a tool belt. In that tool belt, he wore to work. In fact, he used to show me how he would do things. Stina, I'd go down in the basement at night because he, he worked all day. And he'd be working at night after dinner. I'd go down in the basement and he would show me how, with his tools, how he was making something. I could picture these tools I had in my belt. Oh, no. One of them was self-protection. I'm scared of you. I think I'll just have this little wall here between you and me. Oh, this is a bad tool. How can I enjoy that person if I have this self-protection? Because I have fear. Another tool I had was running away. <laughs> when things would get a little dicey, I would head out the back door. I would play in the woods for hours because that was 
what I thought was some sort of like safe place. Well, be prepared to be amazed. That little six-year-old girl, God knew her heart. And one day on my journey to know how to do this, I went to this little old building in a very, very crime-ridden section of Boston. And lo and behold, who were there? Dr. Dennis and Jennifer Clark. In this little church, and the very, very first thing that Dennis talked about was yielding. Well, he said, too, that you can't, that you can't be trusting God and being stressed. I thought, oh, that makes me really mad. I'm, I'm trying. I'm being honest. It made me mad. I thought, I'm trying so hard. What do you mean that doesn't count? Doesn't all this hard work I've been doing count? So anyway, after I got past that, he had everybody... Him and Jennifer, he had everybody sit in the chair. They were sitting in chairs. He said, you know what? I'm going to teach you a better way. I've got tools. Yeah, they had tools that would, could produce abundant life. But the first thing that he wanted to teach us, that they teach you, is we have some internal real estate and God put us together so perfectly. He gave us a mind, a will, and emotions. Well, in my mind, my will was right up here. I am going to cooperate with this, God. I want to cooperate with you. Well, that was good. But that was using my willpower, my own steam, my self-effort, my self-trying to become this living epistle. Now, you know, God is so amazing. In fact, I told Cliff, I was talking about this, it makes me cry, that this six-year-old girl who didn't really know what an epistle was all about would put people in my path that were going to teach me how to live that abundant life that I was so, so longing to have that would produce peace which I really, really lacked peace. I had a lot of wounds. I had a lot of places of rejection. I had a lot of concepts doctrinally that were messed up. I didn't understand the cross. I didn't understand that I had internal real estate and that my there was a Bible heart. When you invited Jesus, into your heart. You didn't invite him up here. You opened the door of your heart, the seat of your emotions. There's a door there that you opened that's your will, that you yielded to him. He came in. You didn't do anything. It was a gift. I had no idea that we would be given the privilege to live like that daily. Wherever we are in life, wherever we are, we have the opportunity to cooperate, to yield to the Lord, to become the story, the God story that he had for you before the beginning of time. He has that, given us that such a privilege to be able to cooperate with the Gosh, just think about this. He's the living God. He's the king of kings. He is the beginning. He is the end. But he wants to be a friend. He wants to be a friend that's closer than a brother. His intention is to transform us. How, and how, how does that happen? It happens just the, through the cross. The cross that we, the cross of Jesus Christ. Now we know positionally that when we're saved, that our sins are covered. But we have ways of behaving. We have attitudes. We have pre, pre uh, uh, I'm trying to say the word, predilection 
to certain behaviors in our life that trip us up, that cause us not to fully flow one with another. Because, you know, his purpose isn't just to reconcile us to him. It's to reconcile us one to another. It says, I love this scripture, and in Ephesians 4, 4 through 7, you were all called to travel on the same road in the same direction. So stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father who rules over all and works through all and is present in all. He is fully present. God's fully present every day. Have you learned to touch his presence? Have you learned to yield your will? Have you invited him into your life? You know, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords lives in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How do we tap into that Christ in us, the hope of glory? Sometimes we thought we'd be praying to some distant, God's out there, oh, please help me. Guess what? He's in here. And when we yield our will, our will's like a door. The same will that we invited Jesus into our heart, we yield that will. And it's a daily yielding. And when we yield that will, we activate that powerful presence of Jesus Christ to be in us, through us, around us, to become carriers of his presence. And how do we become carriers? How do we become that living epistle? Well, everything that passes through death, burial, and resurrection starts to establish the kingdom rule in us. In other words, when we cooperate with God in our daily life, and I'll just give you a simple example. As we start to become aware of our internal real estate, our, our, our sensitivity to God in the day starts to grow. That's when our will is yielded to him. We become aware of his presence throughout our day. And what's the result of God's presence in our life? Peace. God's peace. So say I'm going through my day, and this just happened recently. I ordered something to go. I got it home, some, a food item, and I opened it up, and lo and behold, it was all messed up. And I felt this little uh, irritation in me. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, that's not godly. I thought, oh man, all right. That's, I'm, I'm exhibiting some irritation here. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. We were created to actually have the fruit of the Spirit of God flow through us. So right at that moment, I just received forgiveness for being irritated that things weren't put together the way I wanted them to be. Now, there are things in our life that are little, and there are things in our life that are big. But there's no big and little for Jesus. Jesus can do anything and everything, but, he, but one thing that's required is cooperation. Every person, every day, has the chance to cooperate with the Lord. Now, what I want to talk about as well, too, is that in the bigger picture, as we learn to walk daily with the Lord in our daily lives, as we're aware of our internal, uh, our internal uh, real estate, which is location. Where, where are we in the day? Are we up in our heads trying to figure things out? Are we going about life kind of haphazardly using those tools that we kind of grew up with that maybe aren't just the best. 
when I started to discover that God had better tools for me, it was a nice exchange. I became excited. That made the cross a whole lot nicer. Because you know what we're doing? We're giving up our rights, our demands to do things our way, even if they're good biblical things that we're demanding God to do. When we give those up, we give those rights up, those demands up, those expectations of how we think we should be, we're, and yield to God to have him work through us, and we, we let go of that, we're exchanging our, we can exchange our demands, expectations. We can exchange our hurts, our sorrows, our pain. We can exchange rejection for acceptance. We, this, is, this is the divine exchange. It is absolutely magnificent. You know, God so ma made everybody so unique, and he has a unique way he wants to shine who he is through you that only you can do. Like, I can't be Cliff, and Cliff can't be me, but he has made us uniquely individual with the purpose of having us have the word of God written on our hearts and transformed our hearts. That means that transformation was made available by what Jesus did on the cross. Do you know how to apprehend, to take a hold of, to bring that what he died for into your life in a practical way? To me, that's where the rubber meets the road. This is where the dichotomy of what we positionally have versus what we experience every day, this is where the rubber meets the road, right at the cross. And you know, the most beautiful thing is that when we experience life, death, burial, and resurrection through forgiveness, we have, we start to understand that we have function of the spirit. We are our spirit was made to function for forgiving, for releasing, for receiving. Do you know how to function from your spirit? Do you know how to receive from God? It's the same way you were saved. By yielding that will and receiving. For instance, for rejection, you can receive his 100% acceptance. Now, you know what's even better than that? That can grow. Every reality that God puts in your life that you've experienced has that capacity to grow. In fact, when it talks about in Isaiah, lengthen those tent pegs. We want to expand. You know where God wants to expand? He wants to expand the kingdom within. What he wants to do is to expand his kingdom within us. And Full Stature Ministries gives you the how-tos to expand your personal kingdom, to make your mark, your unique mark for Jesus in your life, where you work, where you live, who you spend time with. He is an equal opportunity vendor. You can have as much of him or as little of him as you want. But he has created a way. I'd encourage anybody, go to the bookstore, look for the 60-day challenge if you don't know how to know, know about your personal real estate. Your will, how does that work? Get on to the school. Pastor Jason's done an amazing job with the school. There are all kinds of teachings there. There are teachings on our, our core values. There are teaching on hierarchy of need. Well, what are our needs? Our needs to be loved, accepted? How are those met? Do we have cracks in those foundational needs? You know how we grew up, as good of a parents that we had, 
there's always those missing links. There's always those places. And you know why God designed it that way? <laughs> he wants to be the one that fills those needs. And he fills them righteously. And they become a place of satisfaction and contentment. You know, when we try to get our needs met in our flesh, there's no satisfaction. There's never going to be enough of whatever. But when they're met in Christ, there's a satisfaction. So I think it's absolutely amazing that God has so designed us. Number one, he wants us to know ourselves. And not through our eyes, but through his eyes. We often take our clues about who we are through circumstances, things that have happened. But God has something to tell us. God has, Jesus, he gave his only son. He has, there's such a passion of God for relationship to draw us with those cords of love into his heart to become those living epistles. You know, an epistle has a lot of chapters in it. I love it that there's chapters. And every chapter has a theme. I bet the chapters of your life have themes. And you know what's exciting? That epistle keeps going on until we meet Jesus. He says every day we have a chance to walk to commune, to fellowship, to enjoy God. Are you enjoying God? Because when you taste that peace and you taste that life, you want more life. Now, if we think about it on an individual, so God's transforming me. Cliff and I live together. God's transforming him. We're becoming something. When we come to church, when we fellowship, when we get together, each one of us is becoming something in him that creates an atmosphere of love, acceptance, forgiveness. And it's an opportunity to become a unique organism, a moving organism that is actually establishing the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. The last song we sang was talking about establishing the kingdom. We have a kingdom within. Every place, full stature, method, no, not method, approach will teach you is that it's to make Jesus Lord. How do you know Jesus is Lord in any area of your life? Peace, absence of conflict. So it's always interesting and very good that when you don't have that, this little thing comes up inside your spirit. Ooh, oh, you know what that is? That's the Lord going, maybe I have my finger on that little place in your life. Because once that wall that barrier is removed. It creates an open space for a deeper fellowship with him, a deeper fellowship with one another. Now, what do you think his goal is, that big goal? What did God create us for? He created us for relationship, to reconcile us back to him, to become that bride, to take, have those living stones for a living stone jointly fit together so that the habitation of God could rest. We're here on earth as it is in heaven. That's the opportunity that we have. A couple of Tuesdays ago, might even be a month ago, we, we, were, talk the, the, we were talking about the mortar of life. 
what brings us together. And somebody said, it could have been you, Garrett, that it's a Holy Spirit glue. So, you know, it's the Holy Spirit that's bringing us together. There is nothing scripturally about being by ourselves. We were created for relationship and we were created for body life. Now, that can be messy, but we have tools. We have tools that we know what to do. I kind of look at it like, in a lot of ways, when we have kids, <laughs> we realize that when they're learning something, it's not, it doesn't go so smoothly. You know, and God looks at us and he goes, oh, well, that doesn't go so smoothly. Point and thing, I was thinking about this, this is just, this is such human nature. Okay, we're Christians, we're going to pray. All right. We got a mission here, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. Well, there was a bunch of people back in the Old Testament days, I mean New Testament days, <laughs> they, they could have been in the Old too, but they were the New Testament. They were praying. Ah, oh, Paul's in jail. All right, let's pray. We're praying. A knock comes on the door. Oh my gosh, ignore it. We're praying. We got a job to do. We're praying. And there they are. Oh, this is annoying. Whoever's drinking that's really annoying. Well, isn't that us? We're, we're there. We're very busy in self-effort. There's Jesus. He's at the door. <laughs> and he's knocking. He says, guess what? I'm right here. I'm the answer. I'm what you're looking for, not just for salvation, but for everyday life. Here I am. And guess what? I've given you the Holy Spirit who leads and guides you into all truth. Hey, you got some places in your life that aren't working? Ah, oh, no problem for me. No big or little for me. You yield to me. And guess what? I'm going to show you. I made you. And I didn't make any mistakes. There's no mistakes made here on earth. God made everyone just the way they are, and he has a plan and a purpose for us. And as we cooperate with him, we become. And, oh, this is the even the best part. When we let Jesus go to those places of unforgiveness, of rejection, of abandonment, of any of those things, and we exchange that for his life, we are carrying that life. We have the, we, then we have something to share with other people. God's given us something that's real. It's exper we experience it and we know, but we know, but we know. So we get to grow in all of these things, acceptance, love, grace, mercy. We get the opportunity every single day. What are you doing? Now, are you focused on intentional living? This is intentional living. This is living biblically every day. How God designed us. You know, when we function the way we're designed, oh, it's a relief. That's what I felt in that first meeting when I went to and Dennis and Jennifer were there. Relief. I had, I had so tried so hard. And you know what? I'm a work in progress. You're a work in progress. But we are going from glory to glory. That every place that we allow the Lord is just to touch, we have that anointing, we have that within to give. And guess what? It oozes out of us. A lot of times, uh, you know, we don't have to say anything. People know that we've, we're changing. People sense. I, there have been people here at Kingdom Life Church have come to church, like Rebecca. Said, people say, Rebecca, wow, we knew Rebecca. And look at, she took a hold of these God tools. And look at the change in her. People come because... People are so desiring peace. Right now in this world, there's a lot, there's a lot of turmoil. 
there's a lot of uncertainty. In times where we don't see clearly at the moment what God is doing, we can be assured that as we're yielded to him, as we're allowing him to search us for any places that are hidden even from us, any secret places that are hidden from us, if we are willing, we know that our roots are growing deep down into Jesus. He's developing our root system so that we may become those oaks of righteousness, that we may become those trees that were planted by the river that had fruit for all seasons. Fruit will be the evidence that Jesus has touched an area in your life. There will be fruit. And that fruit remains. Nobody can take that fruit from you. That's the difference between understanding positionally where we are and where we have experienced him. It's all about the experience. It doesn't detract from the knowledge of the position. It only enhances where positionally and experientially come together. That is where life begins. The life of Christ, that Zoe life, the life that's the light of the world, that we may become a city on a hill with the light of Christ shining in us. It's where death becomes life, where rejection becomes acceptance, where abandonment turns into belonging, where needs are met and satisfaction and contentment are birthed. It's a birthing process. Is it always easy? Nope. But it can be easier if we cooperate. (laughs) The more we don't cooperate, the more that we don't cooperate, the harder it becomes. And the more set we get in our ways. So this is where truth is written on the tablet of our hearts by a loving father who desires us to become intimately acquainted with all his ways, to enjoy, to partake of his love, his acceptance, his forgiveness and grace. This is being a carrier of the presence. This is being a living epistle, a presence that transforms us and those around us. And who knows right now, that we're in an extraordinary time. There is an open invitation to partake in what God has planned for us, for this generation. This is the time that we're in. We also know that this is the time of the the five virgins where they have oil in their, cu- in their cup. Where does that oil come from? It comes through that death, burial, resurrection in our own personal lives. And guess where that leads us? It leads us into the secret place. Do you want a place of safety, a place of security, to be stable and fixed? That stability and that fixing is a place that as we cooperate with our internal real estate, we can get to that place of safety. And that safety is in Jesus, who's all wise, all knowing. You know, he says that he'll tell you where to go, He'll show you the path to walk on, that he goes before you and he is around you. And so we don't have any excuse because we have a loving father who has shown us his way as we become more alive in our spirits and open to the presence of the living God. 
It's a great day. We live in a great time with a great opportunity. And Jesus paid a great price. And he is building us. We are becoming materials in which the Father wants to build here on earth today. Uh, let's hear some applause for that young lady. Yeah, we can. I'm going to close out with some God tools, all right, uh, so, so that you can all be living epistles. What's the, the read by people? Your life should be read. It's not what you know in your head. It's whether your life demonstrates change or not, quality living. The first thing uh, that I'd like to close with this is um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down uh, arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, that scripture, people have known that for a long time, but I just loved it in the message because it portrays really what Stina was sharing about God tools. The wep in in uh, the message translation, which is a paraphrase, it says, uh, we have these God tools and they bring every loose thought, emotion, and impulse captive into a life toward maturity. And these tools are ready and at hand. Well, where are they? They're in you. They're not far, far away. These God tools are the ability to draw on him. Well, we've taught, and this has gone worldwide, we've got probably 3,000 in our online school, and they've all heard this inside out and backwards just like you folks have. Uh, but if you're listening, one of the key elements uh, that even amongst leaders, uh, they were, they were uh, reorientated in a sense, was when we began telling people to, uh, to drop down, that was our term, Okay, drop down, because we didn't know how else to explain it. So we would just say drop down. And in reality, the word in your Bible is put on. Think about that. Everywhere you look in, your, in the New Testament scriptures, put on. Put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man, put on, put on, put on. Put on bowels of mercy. Put on the armor of light, the Lord Jesus, put on, put on. And it's basically just overlooked. And it's yet the most beautiful scripture. It's in the Greek, it's enduo. And it means to sink into in order to be clothed. Put on is not something you grab out here and put on like a hat. You have within you a relationship with Jesus in you. And when you put on love, put on, he's the source. And you... You have to sink into him for to wear it. In other words, you've got to go down before it goes up. Uh, it would be like being baptized in water. Did you ever know? The element does not cover you until you sink into it. Well, drop down is going to the secret place. And the secret place is not far, far away. But one of the things we learned is we were going to churches, particularly in the New England area, large churches and small, and... Uh, even in the large church, I was a little disappointed when I says, point to your will. And they would go like this. No, that's where you give consent. But this is the will. The will is, and if you want to know where the will is, stand up and let yourself fall backwards. That's unnatural. You don't want to fall backwards. You would have to release the will down here. That grip that you have down here. Stress does not start up here. Stress starts down here where you're hanging on and it rises up. Now, we taught that we would say, um, uh, we'd say scriptures like this, and this is sometimes in crowds of a thousand people, and we would say, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Quick, point to Jesus. 98% of the church pointed to the sky. There is, there is a distance deception that we were to have him in us on earth. 
getting the kingdom of God in us. The kingdom of God is within you. But why, why is there this distance concept? Why when you ask people, and you could even say scripture, Christ in you, the hope of glory, where is he? Why do they do that? There's a relational distance that has to be, that gap has to be closed. Um, one of the things that we recommend right now, uh, too, is um, to sink into in order to be clothed, that this is the source and that everything flows from this. And we just uh, learned of another word, friend of mine. We have a, we have a, a studious uh, young man in the Bronx that uh, he was the one that sent me in duo, actually. He said, what you're saying about drop down is actually in the Greek and duo, to sink into in order to be clothed. All right? You want peace in your, to guard your heart and your mind? You've got to go to Jesus. That's the only legitimate peace. And then it rises up and guards your heart and your mind. Now, you know these scriptures, but the how-tos are sorely lacking. Now, here's a new one for you. Are you ready for a new one? After all these years, we got a new one. Our little resident scholar in the Bronx sent me another one. And that is, he knows that we're, we've been on the fear of the Lord challenge. And we're saying, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth, people aren't afraid of her. They respect her. And you have to understand reverence and awe. Fear can really throw you for a loop, that word fear, the fear of the Lord. And if you were raised in a dysfunctional family where, where the uh, father was a tyrant, you hear a scripture like the fear of the Lord challenge. You go, I don't think I need that challenge. I had enough of that in my life. You know, I had, I had enough of that. But the fear is not that kind of fear. But here's the best one. Yara, Y-A-R-A. Do a word study on that. If you were to, Yara means like the flowing of life. Like a, where, and wherever that river goes, flows like, you know, Ezekiel 47, are you familiar? That the water flowed from the base of the temple. Are you familiar with the fact that Jesus says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink for out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Yara is, you could actually say it this way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You could say, the flow of life from its source, from God within, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So we've spent a lot of time teaching people how to locate, to use their God tools, how to function from the Spirit instead of from their head. Everywhere we went to churches, there was biblically literate people that didn't know how to do it. <laughs> they knew. They could quote it back to you. But knowing... Is, we're talking about knowledge, intimate knowledge of him. 90% didn't know how to forgive even. Uh, we, we prayed with professional counselors. One of them was ready to quit, and most of them were in tears before we were done, simply because we showed them that they did pray after me prayers without ever having really touched the, the, the emotion, the pain, the Jesus takes your pain and sorrow. If the pain and sorrow didn't go, you can say all the scripture you want. It's not going to work. You know, we watch people go, a perfect love cast out fear, a perfect love cast out fear, a perfect love cast Well, that's the right answer. But trust me, if the fear doesn't go, you've accomplished nothing except repeating the right answer. So to put on was to sink into and go to the source, but the yara, or the fear of the Lord is to have, and you can do a study on this. There's a, there's a uh, everybody knows the Hebrew is a pictorial language, and it and it shows, and and root words and derivative words are very important to understand. It's just like a tree. It's important to understand that there's roots to that tree. Well, yara is a beautiful word that's translated fear, uh, and a lot of the fear of the Lord uses yara. Correct. We looked up, I don't know what, a dozen or so. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord challenge is not being frightened. That's the wrong kingdom. The fear of the Lord is f flowing the way you were intended to flow from the heart. The fear of the Lord is the beginner. That's wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. But what kind of knowledge? 
intimate knowledge. It has to flow from the source. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. You walk out of that reality and you walk in that peace and you walk in the flow of God. So now you've got two words. And duo, which is nothing more than learning where the secret place is. And the secret place isn't far away. The secret place is that place where you and God meet. It's the place where there's a romance of wills. It's the place where that will yielded to his will. It's like he builds his strength and wraps around your will until it becomes a scepter of authority because you are under authority. There's no real authority that's not under authority. So when, you, when, you, uh, when we say drop down or go to the secret place, you know that secret place, you can have a chair, you can have a room in your house where you pray. That, in a sense, can be a secret place. But the way I look at your relationship with God, it has to be twofold. It has to be special time and all the time special time and all the time. That's the way Jesus gave us the example. That's the way he lived. It was special time and all the time. Didn't Jesus spend time apart in prayer? But then he also was in communion and union with God in the hustle and bustle of day-to-day -day life. That was one of the most uh, uh, rewarding things that we did over the years. One of the rewarding things was uh, in uh, my first pastorate teaching, uh, I had a lot of nurses, teaching those nurses how to function at work and gave them the peace challenge, challenged them to walk in more of divine peace. Because what happened was they were taught, you know, like emergency room doctor, uh, ICU uh, uh, nurse, rather, uh, ICU emergency room, you, you are kind of trained to protocol, but don't get emotionally evolved. Well, whatever gets suppressed is going to be expressed later. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. They don't, you can't really, you can stuff it, but it doesn't really work. Remember? Uh, in, in France, I was using the word stuff, and the translator was having trouble getting that, <laughs> getting that across. So finally, all of a sudden, it was like you could feel in the atmosphere. They weren't getting it, and I don't think the translator was getting it. I kept saying stuff. Well, to them, stuff is like stuff a sausage, you know, stuff a pillow. You know, <laughs> they, they didn't quite have a, a handle on it. But I said, you can't uh, suppress. And then what, what was the, uh, Jennifer can speak French. What was it? Abandon. Abandonné. Abandonné. Surrender. Be surrender. And as soon as they said, oh, surrender. The power of God flooded the whole room <laughs> because they let go from the heart because they were trying, you know, you, you can white knuckle it all you want. It doesn't take you anywhere. And, and uh, but I believe that what God's doing in the days ahead is, is we're all going to be uh, more and more living epistles. In other words, change lives. Uh, evangelists. Uh, are thrilled when they see someone get born again. And that's like, that's fruit to them. Uh, for me, give me a Christian who's been around for 30 years, knows the right answers, but is not living in the kind of victory that they should be. And teach them that even though uh, evangelical church is a little bit to blame, uh, because they've, you know, they says, you can't live by your feelings. And that's a truth. But if you carry that truth too far, you ignore them. And God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being, and all three of those need to be under the lordship of Jesus. You can't skip one just because it's not comfortable. And in reality, why did God even give you emotions in the first place? For the fruit of the Spirit. I've seen people that went to theologically sound teachings on the fruit of the Spirit, but nobody had any. Or, or it was remarkably lacking, but the information was remarkably accurate and good. Fruit was meant to be enjoyed. It was meant to be experienced through the emotions. But if your emotions are all clogged up, oh, I like this one, men. Well, that's a woman thing, that emotion thing. That's a woman. Oh, okay, so we, we change it for the men to show that we're merciful. We change it to stress. I've never ran into a man that didn't understand stress. 
You know what stress is by definition? To be emotionally controlled by people or circumstances or both. So there, you are emotional. And besides, I've seen you on the road, men. You have emotions. Come on. They might not be good ones, <laughs> but you've got them. And God wants you whole. And the only way, and here's the other thing that we saw. We saw people that were like myself, like Stina, like Jennifer. We were raised under some difficult situations and some a lot of woundings. Uh, but how to deal with it uh, is really where the key is. And it, if you could see, uh, Stina covered that with God, big and little doesn't exist. With us, it does. Right? There was minor offenses. Then there was things that we call trauma, which, by the way, that word is getting a little too much attention. In my day, uh, they started to go with the, um, <clears throat> with the, uh, the word abuse. Uh, and gradually I saw abuse get abused. <laughs> and if you burnt the toast, you, you, you were suffering abuse because somebody, my wife burned my toast and I'm being abused. You know, you can extract, same thing with trauma. I'll tell you what, there's nothing too big or too little for God. And trauma now is being exaggerated. There's real trauma. I'm not saying there isn't. People in the medical field, they know. They've seen people when they've come in. I've dealt with people that, were, that prayed for people that were in, uh, uh, curled up in the fetal position. I understand that's a reality. But I'm also saying that Jesus said, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Now, for us, there'd be a difference. I could say forgiveness easier than I could see someone get up out of their bed and walk, healed. But for him, big and little doesn't exist. We're going to learn to take, if, if you were traumatized by something, if you could just present it, PTSD, we've seen uh, wonderful results with that. But what they had to do, and that scares them half to death, is that fear. God won't take something in most cases unless you present it to him. And you can't present it to him theoretically. Like, okay, Jesus, uh, just uh, forgive. I forgive Aunt Eleanor, you know. No. When you think of Aunt Eleanor down here, there's this... Tsh. All you have to do is feel it. Here's the key word. Momentarily. Momentarily and just a little bit of it. Enough to honestly say you're giving it... I don't want to feel a lot of that garbage that I need ministry on over the years. But to feel it momentarily, to give it to Jesus, and the yara takes place out of your belly. He's the only one that can take sin. And when you forgive, doesn't it say you must forgive? Who's doing the forgiving? The scripture says only God can forgive sin, but then God says you must forgive. So that doesn't mean you forgive independently. It means if the two of you are not doing it, flowing from the heart, it's not going to happen. Head agreement to forgiveness doesn't work. Who's doing the forgiving then? It's got to be the new creation you. Who's the new creation you? That's not the independent you doing it from your head. That's the new creation you, that you that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him and out of my belly's flowing, the yara, the fear of the Lord, a life flow from the source, the living word flowing from the source. Please uh, take the time and do, do a study. Y-A-R-A. And, and look that up because uh, it's in too many cases you see fear of the Lord and, and, and you think terror. All right. There's a place for that. But you need to understand that when it comes from the source of God, it's not it's the fear of the Lord that pours forth. But where does it pour forth from? From the heart. What have we done for years? We have to teach people how to get out of their heads and down to the heart. All right. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Lord. I ask you to take this word and cause people to be challenged. In Jesus name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit 
forgive123.com.